Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Adam Savitt. I'm happy to welcome you back to the Center for Security Policy for our webinar series. Remember, we do this every Wednesday at 1 p.m. Eastern time. To check out our schedule, go to securefreedom.org and check under the webinar tab. I'll also give you a preview of upcoming events at the end of today's broadcast. Today's program is entitled Artificial Intelligence and the Wars of the Future, featuring our guests, Admiral Joe Sestak and Ken Rapuano and moderated by my center colleague, John Rosamondo. Please note that you are in listen-only mode, but you can submit your text questions in the Q&A box in your GoToWebinar panel, and I'll read as many questions as possible at the end of the program. This event is being recorded and will be available on our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash securefreedom, as well as our website at securefreedom.org. With that, I'll hand it to, my, uh, to the center's senior analyst for defense policy, John Rosamondo. Thank you. I'd like to uh, thank my distinguished guest. I'm uh, happy to uh, have uh, uh, Admiral uh, Joe Sastak, his longtime uh, friend, uh, and uh, met in his, uh, I've learned a lot over the years about defense policy. Uh, and we're going to be discussing artificial intelligence, uh, along with also uh, Ken Rapuano, uh, the former Assistant Secretary of Defense uh, for Homeland Security and Global Policy, uh, who uh, oversaw the uh, artificial intelligence uh, cyber uh, portfolio at the Pentagon until the end of the uh, Trump administration. AI is something that is dear and near to my heart because my father worked on artificial intelligence uh, related to uh, SDI back in the 1980s and early 1990s. So uh, when uh, Joe uh, started talking to me a few months ago about where I, the importance of AI in the military. I was like, this would be something that would be ideal to uh, talk about. I, maybe that maybe Ken can start off by telling us a little bit about some of the history, the principles of AI, or uh, one of the one of the uh, obstacles to implementing AI across the military, and why it's so important in the 21st century with Russia and China both. Uh, putting AI in the driver's seat of their policies. Thanks a lot, John. I uh, appreciate the opportunity. So I think it's important to note right up front that there is no official US government, uh, or for that matter, DOD definition of artificial intelligence. The recent DOD AI strategy defines it as the ability of machines to perform tasks that normally require human intelligence. So that's a very wide definition set. And the fact of the matter is we have had artificial intelligence systems really starting right after World War II and in, and in the final stages of World War II. And essentially that is a combination of data and rule sets in terms of how you can compute and obviously at the outset, very basic computer systems you take data set and then you do a if then type algorithm in the computer. So if you have a data set of the types of symptoms that individuals might have, that data set could be reviewed according to a rule set. The rule set would filter out uh, whether or not there are uh, indicators associated with the types and groupings of symptoms and it will say, uh, assessment is that it is this diagnosis and then it would provide uh, a set of recommendations or a set of options in terms of treatment so that's the if then requirement for a sometimes very significant database very detailed rule set and we've been using that and it's increasing the sophistication of that approach really since the end of world war ii what is going to be different going forward and we've seen the development of uh, why is AI a huge issue right now? And the reason is you're seeing more massive databases, increased computing power by multiple orders of magnitude, improved machine learning algorithms. That's where machines, rather than humans, put in and characterize all the data. The machines now are starting to develop the capability or machines are being developed with the capability to do their own learning. And then finally, the open source code libraries and frameworks, where now there are standardized approaches, open source codes, frameworks for collecting data, and it provides a huge cache of data to be used. 
So the transition that is so fascinating today in terms of the paradigm shift that we're on the edge of is going from rule-based database systems uh, for which uh, as a general and, and, and very common rule, the decisions, the final decisions are made by humans or the decisions are so simple like an automatic door opener when it sense, senses an object in the way where it opens the door and the consequences of it malfunctioning are so low, those could be autonomized, they could be made automatic. And obviously that's a very, very simple example. But today you're talking about essentially what is being called the third wave of contextual or cognitive adaptation of machine learning to actually come up with uh, the machines themselves come up with clear and logical mental models to actually make decisions without the input of humans and ultimately being developed with the ambition of them being able to have the confidence in the system, that would be the, the human side of the equation, to have autonomous actions taken by the platform. So there's tremendous promise in terms of the impacts in terms of the capabilities of these systems, but there's also significant peril, particularly when you look at the militarized context. So, so that's, that's something to, to be understanding of what the trade-offs are. And I'll just make another point because we could spend the entire hour just talking about the background, the history, the baselines involved with AI. But when you have a, when you have a system and you have the ability to achieve cognition of that system, we have some really difficult ethical and legal challenges, particularly when it comes to the Department of Defense, because you're talking about the apl application of these systems, not like a commercial automated vehicle in a highly structured environment, but you're talking about it in an environment where we have intelligent adversaries who are seeking to confound the algorithms of the systems or otherwise undermine them. And you've got, uh, you've got an unknown environment, a much less regulated environment that these systems have to operate in. So two big questions that are being wrestled with is first what's called machine permissibility, which is what fully autonomous actions of these machines will be allowed? And then the concept of a machine accountability. When that autonomy is authorized, who takes responsibility for the outcomes? And there is the possibility, again, particularly in military applications for, for uh, negative outcomes associated with these unintentional consequences associated with the employment of the systems. So again, tremendous capabilities. It's not a question of whether the US invests in these systems because our adversaries clearly are, and it's not like we're starting from zero We've been investing in AI again for 50, over 50 years. The question is, how do we do it responsibly? And how do we also match, compete, and beat the efforts of our adversaries? So let me just leave it at that, uh, turn it over to, to Joe. Well, if I could just sort of like bridge it in there. I mean, uh, Joe, you were a uh, Naval uh, commander, commanded the uh, USS uh, George Washington battle group, you know, if you've worked in, in the Pentagon and Congress and so forth, how do you uh, see AI transforming how we uh, fundamentally do uh, warfare in the face of an AI a competitor like China or Russia that could possibly be uh, peer or uh, better uh, in the battle space? Uh, thanks, John, and thanks for having me here. And Ken, um, it's an honor to be with you. Thanks for what you've done for our nation's security. Um, I think, John, that there are immense implications, strategic implications because of artificial uh, intelligence, both societal as well as in warfare. I mean, societal is pretty obvious, just what happened in this COVID-19. You as Israeli scientists using artificial intelligence that made synthetic medical records right away of their patients who were hospitalized. And from that, some of the best means of how to better treat hospitalized COVID-19 patients was developed. And that was all by artificial intelligence. But in warfare, the implications are equally, if not even more, immense. And I bring that up because of the new public commons that only came about in the last few decades that is out there today. 
It used to be after World War II that there was the global commons of the seas and the Navy commanded it. And we used that sea and we only gave permission to others to use it at our sufferance. We commanded those seas. We did the same for the international airspace above it, the great international commons of the airs with our air forces. And all. But today, the new real domain, the dom dominant domain of warfare, and increasingly so every day, is the public commons of cyberspace. And that's everywhere, even over land. And anyone can be in it or out of it, using it, misusing it. And so what is important about artificial intelligence is how it greatly enables an adversary or ourselves to use it in warfare. But it's also greatly enabled by other technology, quantum computing, the 5G network. I mean, with quantum computing, you can break passwords if all works out in the next decade, because it's based upon using not electrical switches, but subatomic particles, that you'll be able to break a password in nanoseconds, and the other side won't even know you've done it. And look at today, we just found out that the Chinese had broken into our defense agencies, and we didn't even know it today, and that they broke into also defense contractors, and we can't even tell what data they took away. And so with quantum computing and the ability to have computing power that really makes our uh, ability to use artificial intelligence so swift and quick, when you're beginning to build a naval fleet that based upon 30 knots, we're gonna get over the hill to the Western Pacific in the next few weeks, while Grand has shown corporations, 17 of 18 war games, ships hardly matter. They shatter, they splinter, the Chinese do the brains, the nervous systems, the internet, the data. And by shattering them, splintering them, they gain Taiwan as we're still going at the speed of 30 knots. And they've done it in nanoseconds through cyber warfare, increasingly more with artificial intelligence. And so when you step back and see what the Chinese are doing, to, to your point, John, this is happening every day in the battle space. As they have the Belt and Road Initiative globally, and under that, there is the Silk Road, the digital Silk Road, where over 50% of the world's population, if nothing changes, will start to use their 5G network. And there's a little device that only three companies in the world make, and one of them's China, that whoever builds the 5G network, all data will goes through that little piece of equipment in the wireless network, and they own that data to do what Ken said begin to have that billions and billions of data that they need to begin to improve the algorithms or to take ours down to artificial intelligence. So the implications of this are, are absolutely tremendous. And that's the challenge we have to change a culture to we still measure, for example, in my service, our prowess by the number, the quantity of physical ships. And that's not the target any longer. <laughs> to truly win, you need to dominate that cyberspace through artificial intelligence. I'll end by saying this really isn't just about technology. Don, this is really overall about a battle of values. When you watch what the Chinese have done to the Uyghur citizens in Xinjiang province, done a digital incarceration of them, increasingly building up their own artificial intelligence to do it to its own population, to where it's not only facial recognition, they know where they are, but gate recognition to where they know who and what they are just by that. You begin to see why this 5G network is such a threat to us because they will be collecting the data and it's through all those 5G networks that all this internet will pass like signals intelligence that can be closed down by them. So as we end, if you truly do want to have a world, once again, ruled by a rules-based world order led by the United States based on democratic values, or to have one that the Malaysian prime minister has said, China is the new colonial power, to where it forces Cambodia, Djibouti, and Sri Lanka to give it a port to get out of its debt, and it does to the Muslim Uyghur citizens what it does. This really is something where technology has to be, as Ken said, done no matter what to pursue, if we are to retain a world based upon democratic values and not authoritarian ones. Well, let me just sort of like follow that up by asking Ken, considering that you oversaw you know, cyber for the Department of Defense, what, how can we use artificial intelligence of uh, platforms 
to counter, you know, these uh, hack attacks by China, by the Russians, and also uh, to be able to uh, counter their effort to employ uh, AI in uh, missile technologies, in uh, you know, planes, warships, et cetera. Well, let me first take a step back and, 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 and pose the first question that I ask, which is when we look at the advent of the internet and the construction of the system, so to speak, what are lessons learned with regard to the vulnerabilities that are inherent in, in the, the web? Uh, when you look at the uh, permeability associated with the ability of adversaries to access and manipulate within that system. And as we start building AI architecture, particularly as it gets more extensive, how do we, how do we design in defenses and resilience against the ability of adversaries to use cyber, assisted by AI to uh, manipulate, otherwise undermine the systems, whether they're cyber or their AI, and you're going to see more and more meshing and combination of those things. Obviously, we intend to use artificial intelligence, uh, the more evolved forms, which, which again are looking at developing that level of machine learning, cognition, and perception that are so critical to making decisions in time. You know, the bottom line is you don't have to make the fastest decisions possible. You simply have to make decisions faster than your adversary in the time of relevance. So how do we look at the ability to defend ourselves from penetrations, misadventures of our adversaries? And how do we develop the capabilities to access their systems, understand what their capabilities are, understand where the vulnerabilities are, map them out, so we have the ability and capabilities to engage appropriately depending on the circumstances. So let me just sort of like uh, move, move into the uh, next uh, you know, front, which is sort of uh, the battle space and some of the obstacles that we might have. I mean, do you see any problems you know, coming from Congress uh, in terms of Know, how we organize and uh, you know, focus our, our resources. I know that uh, President Biden is really uh, heavy on AI uh, technologies uh, through the uh, Joint Artificial Intelligence Center and uh, so forth. I mean, what do you see ahead as some of the uh, challenges? This is a back and forth between you know, uh, Ken and uh, Joe. Yeah, so... The way I see it is we're still in very d early days of, of what people describe as the third way wave of AI, which is this perception, cognition, and uh, the capability to autonomize, where you develop such sophisticated capabilities and the confidence that those systems will make the appropriate answers uh, at, at, at moderate enough risk. So I would argue there are two spectrums. There's the spectrum of AI going back to the more primitive uh, early days AI to this turning point that we're out to, at today, which will be the perceptual, cognitive, more possibility of autonomous AI. Then there's the spectrum of conflict, starting with peace, competition, and then that threshold of armed conflict into high intensity conflict. What your trade-offs are in terms of what I asked, talked about before, permissibility and accountability in terms of the employment of these systems, you're going to have different trade-offs in the middle of a high-intensity conflict than you are in steady-state peace. Competition, gray zone, which is what the Chinese and the Russians have really begun to specialize in an asymmetric way, targeting the U.S. in competition, the types of activities, whether it's stealing intellectual property, other aggressive actions, but they fall below that threshold. They want to beat us without having to fight us because they understand the advantages that we have in high intensity conflict. So, so that's, that, those are the domains that we need to be thinking about with regard to prior to World War II, the U.S. was very opposed to unrestricted submarine warfare. At the advent after Pearl Harbor, that decision changed. 
based on what the stakes were for the United States, how, per, how important the Pacific and, and seafaring traffic was in particular to the Japanese. So we have to have a system that is going to be able to meet the requirements of the circumstances. And they are very different in peacetime and competition than they will be in a high intensity conflict. Yeah. I was just gonna say, ask uh, Joe where he sees you know, AI playing a role, uh, you know, from a battlefield commander's uh, you know, perspective. You know, if you're facing threats from uh, like hypersonic missiles aimed at your battle group, or if you're uh, having to uh, deal with uh, you know, various AI uh, threats, I mean, how does that change your calculus? I think it changes it tremendously. The real question, because, because what you have here is a commander in the Western Pacific today, the commander of the entire Pacific, Admiral Davison, who has said two years ago, the United States Navy now no longer commands the Western Pacific. China does. And what he said is surge forces can't help us. It doesn't get there in time. You needed more forward assets, including the ability of cyber and sensors to be there, to act immediately. So if you don't have the ability, as we develop hypersonic missiles, to shoot one down because no human being is able when that hypersonic missile moves quickly to be able to change and steer the other one to intercept, your own to intercept it, you need AI to do it. But the real question, therefore, is will that commander ever have the tools to the question you asked earlier, John? Because what is what President Eisenhower, they say in his next to last speech called the military industrial congressional complex, allegedly crossing out congressional because he didn't want to offend his, his colleagues there. I can remember going to Congress and I wanted to be on a cyber committee. The cyber committee, there wasn't any. It, and it wasn't even hardly mentioned in any of the subcommittees of the armed services. And I remember sitting next to a wonderful congresswoman I said, why are you here? She said, to protect my depot. And I remember a senator who, when we recommended we needed less ships, we needed to move into cyber in 2005, and later I entered politics, said, Joe, I remember you. You wanted to take down our submarine fleet. <laughs> and my point is this. There are great obstacles out there to changing the military. We still are bent upon measuring our prowess, like we once measured how great America was by how many telephones there were. Well, now we still measure how many ships we have rather than having a culture that understands that when we deploy, not only do should we measure yourself, are you C1 in, that is ready in anti-air warfare, anti-submarine for anti-surface warfare, we don't even measure if that ship is ready in cyberspace warfare. And so when the Secretary of the uh, Navy's report came out two years ago, so the Navy has said we're really tremendous in having an ability to which Ken brought up wisely of defending ourselves against cyber attack, the report by three outside civilians said, no, you're not, you're pretty bad. And it is because you're focused on having what we used to win in the past, but just having it lot more of it. And so the obstacles to this change are tremendous because it's a cultural change, it is going to take young men and women who actually understand, to Ken's point earlier, what is AI in, in reality, and beginning to understand that industry, it cannot just hold on to building the battleship any longer. We need to transfer to the new realm of warfare to get that commander in the Western Pacific the tools it to able to survive. Well, just let me ask you this, Joe, considering, you know, you've spent uh, two terms in Congress. How do you change the uh, culture in Congress and get the members of Congress to understand this uh, paradigm shift instead of focusing uh, on, you know, J-O-B-S in uh, his or her uh, district or in his or her state and get the bigger picture? Because I think that we have a Huge, huge strategic deficit. It is going to be a tremendous obstacle because at the end of the day, a Congress member really does want to represent and protect the jobs that are there. All that said, first, the best ways Congress can do it is by incentivizing, not mandating. Ken will well remember as a Marine, 
that they would say after we could couldn't have a marine go had to go ashore and wanted naval gunfire support in Grenada and had to put a nickel into the telephone to call Navy headquarters back in, in Norfolk, Virginia, to say, "Can you put land your uh, how was you know, your shells here, please?" Because they couldn't communicate. We had no jointness, so they said, "Look, you want to become a general, you want to become an admiral, do two tours in joint with another service." and go to a joint war college. They need to incentivize that those who will rise in rank are the new warriors of the future, those who understand artificial intelligence. As the National Commission has similarly said, there's ways to do this. Second of all, it truly does need a commander in chief who understands what this portends to us and that he will have the courage to come forward much like, well, Billy Mitchell did to get court-martialed over making sure the Navy got an aircraft carrier, not a battleship, and be willing to be, even to lose their job over saying, I'm sorry, some industries can't survive any longer as much. We still need submarines, but when you have quantum computing in the future, it comes about being able to measure heights of waves going up and down because metallic large object is moving underneath it, Maybe we don't need as many. What we need is someone who can develop better algorithms for that artificial intelligence. And then I would say you truly need to make sure that you help industry transition to this new type of warfare and not just shut them down. So to me, it's incentivizing the military to raise warriors in, in the right culture at the top. And second, it's truly having some courage, I believe, as a politician to say, this is needed. America's security won't survive, and it isn't today, according to the commander of the Pacific. And those are the elements that are, I believe, are needed. And so what are your what are your thoughts on you know, what uh, he was saying, Ken? So, I mean, I I, I agree. I think that um, I think, of course, we all appreciate that for the last twenty plus years, we we've been fighting uh, insurgency. I mean, that has been the focus of the United States, and it really was only with the advent of the new national defense strategy, or at least uh, circa 2018, where we see the pivot to peer competition. But we're really behind the curve in a lot of respects, and I think Do Joe touches on a number of them. Uh, we have not, we have been focused for the, for the last very few years on peer competition cyber in particular, because that is an area where sophisticated adversaries uh, uh, are looking to target our vulnerabilities. And we know there are many vulnerabilities in, in cyberscape. So I think that when it comes to AI, which is an augmentative uh, ability to leverage these newfound capabilities that uh, have been generated by the evolution of, again, the data state set, the computing power, the 5G, how do we best lever that, leverage that to achieve our objectives? And I think AI is still very novel to many people. Uh, if you look at the National Commission on AI, they put out a very thoughtful report. They've got a number of recommendations. And, and yes, a lot of that emphasis, uh, the per, a couple of the points that Joe made is all about, we need to invest in this. We need to invest in the theory of war, the theory of victory associated with how and where AI can augment. And AI obviously has applications throughout economic, social, and every sphere that there is. So what is AI? Uh, the Jake put out a report a little while ago, and I thought, again, it was, it's very educational, very useful. And the point was made in the Jake's report that Nearly all DOD officials understand AI is important, but many struggle with what it actually is. AI is an enabler, it's, it's not an outcome. So, you know, the questions of what is AI, how does it work, what, what, it, what is now, why is now an important time for AI? Again, all of those factors that, that we see happening at the same time. How does machine learning apply? But most importantly, what objectives do we believe that we can achieve? And what are the limitations, risks, and benefits for applying AI that we need to work on so that we are not doing a ready shoot aim with regard to applying technology that's not ready, having significant negative outcomes because of that, and then we put ourselves 
behind the curve for who knows how long because of it. So we need to be pushing as fast as we can, but we need to be doing it in a manner that is going to be consistent with our objectives, as well as our ethics and principles. So how do we define what our objectives are? Because, you know, in any kind of leadership, any kind of vision, you begin with the end in mind. I mean, Sun Tzu says that the uh, you know war is either won or lost before the uh, first uh, troops are committed. So how do we define what the goal is and what do you uh, both uh, see should be our vision and our uh, mission goal? Well, I think Ken, if I were to, to speak to that, I think Ken was the one who initially brought up something we just have to do now, and that is just defend our cyber security systems above anything else. We have to protect ourselves. So what does that mean? And all you have to do is set up a red team and set up your own team and actually go through the system to find the back doors that might be there. Because we have so many legacy systems that the Defense Science Board has said they would not believe right now that one of them was 100% secure. Then you step back and you bring in the experts and you actually go through what does that mean and you test them. There's all sorts of consulting firms out there that do that all the time and you find those systems. Second, to what Ken said again, the training is absolutely critical. I mean, every day we do a fire drill at sea. Well, why aren't we doing a cybersecurity drill every day of training to remind that gentleman who, before he walks on a ship, if you see a flash drive sitting there on the, on, on the wharf, don't pick it up and stick it into the computer like the Iranians did and the sticks virus took them down. I mean, that's kind of a basic thing, but it's the training and the mindset again and again. But above all else, to Ken's point, much like you had a few people, the Billy Mitchells or whoever it was, that understood the new warfare out there, if you don't appoint leaders who really understand it, we will never get there to where that above anything else has to be done. And to me, just going through how we transformed to an aircraft carrier after a while, to how we moved into a nuclear powered submarine. What a revolution. We have the same type of an approach here. We say we want a lot of it, whatever it is. <laughs> we should be saying we want a love of it, and here's how we get to it. I mean, if private industry can do it, why can't we? I'm not saying they're doing it perfectly, but they sure are, as Ken was mentioning the other day to me. Hey, you know, now they're even making uh, types of software that. The maker can't break into it. So there's means to do this, but first defend ourselves and then be ready to make sure that if there is a war, we have been able to have the back doors into their software. We're able to get into them and being able to say, today's not your day because we can do this. I mean, one of the things moving on, uh, Ken, kind of in the other uh, domain, I mean, I sort of think a good part of, uh, you know, defending oneself is having a good offense. How do we uh, develop AI such that we can get into the uh, Chinese, Russian, Iranian uh, systems and, uh, you know, show them that we're able to, uh, you know, do uh, to them to an extent to what they did uh, to us. I spoke with uh, Admiral Sandy Winnefeld uh, for one of these webinars a few months back. And uh, he was, uh, you know, advocating using uh, cyber to uh, say take down the uh, great, great firewall to be able to end uh, the Chinese ability to limit the information that gets to its uh, citizens, or you know, just to uh, play games with, uh, say, Vladimir Putin, uh, you know, like things to. Uh, embarrass him with information posted on you know, different uh, you know, social media websites in Russia or bulletin boards, et cetera. So I, I think, that's, I think that, that's all true. And I think in fairness, there is a tremendous amount of activity in those areas uh, within the US government writ large and within the Department of Defense in particular. Um, uh, do we have room for improvement and emphasis, increased emphasis? 
absolutely. I, I think that when you look at uh, all of the challenges out there and you look at, I mean, cyber, of course, is a very wide discipline as well. It comes, it goes all the way from the cybersecurity of networks and systems and weapons, all the way to uh, of the range of cyber enabled operations for which we have planning and capabilities. Uh, and and uh, obvi obviously a lot of sensitivity associated with a number of those areas. But there, there is the emphasis, uh, does there need to be more resources and emphasis? I, I would say yes. But I, I would also, uh, I would also just note that there is a tremendous amount of resources and effort going into this right now. Uh, I'm a champion for, for more because it's that important. And I think our adversaries are focused again in the asymmetric categories for which cyber and, and AI as another enabler are gonna play critical roles. And uh, we need to be looking at where we can augment that. You know, where's our schoolhouse for cyber? The military has schoolhouses for cyber, but what's, what is our national investment associated with critical infrastructure resilience associated with cyber? All of these different potential targets, as well as how cyber can enable a, a number of other functional areas, both in the military defense context, but in the societal and and the industry and economy side as well. Well, this is sort of going to be, you know, a free for all. Uh, so, how do we get uh, industry, uh, the defense uh, establishment, uh, politicians on the Hill, you know, the White House, uh, you know, President Biden, et cetera, to come together and uh, you know develop a comprehensive vision and strategy for you know, removing some of these silos? Well, you know, obviously that is a real tough issue, but we have been outsourcing our national security for far too long. You own an Android phone right now, everything that's on it surreptitiously gets sent back to China because that's the way it's made. You've heard the contentious report that was done by Bloomberg a couple of years ago and I emphasize contentious, that there is on the servers in Apple and Amazon, on Aegis cruisers and CIA drones, little chips put into the hardware, because it's the hardest thing to try to see or find as you import these servers. But even if it's not done, as every expert can say, it can be done. So it's a Trojan horse that Oak wakes up when you want it to, to do damage that's at least an appropriate time. First off, what I, to answer your question, get control of our supply chains. And there is efforts to doing that, that, this, uh, that Ken has been involved in. My gosh, all 300 critical materials that we want to use in the military, parts of that all come from China. And, you know, I'm not painting China as a bad boy. I'm chaining, uh, I am uh, uh, saying that they are a, a, a country that is a great country that I backpack through took leave in the military. So our first year it opened it up to independent travel. Man, I'll tell you, it was awe-inspiring. And you could tell they were gonna become a great nation. But when I came home and had surreptitiously taken pictures of a few Navy ships I had seen, and <laughs> Naval uh, Intelligence Service had no interest in it. When I backpacked through communist Europe, they were all over me for four hours. We haven't kept our eye on what China has been up to to more recently in these years. And in my mind, controlling that supply chain, saying you want to make it over there, it's going to cost you on an inspection that everything we has to be inspected before we're going to use it in our military. However you're going to bring it about, it has to be done by industry because we have placed the supply chain for our most sophisticated equipment over there. Congress has just got to be able by the conviction of the military, walking over the most respected institution in this nation that says basically, your sons and daughters aren't gonna come home. And Commander Davison has already said, we've lost command of the seas unless we change to this area of warfare that you know little about. It isn't about another ship. It is about having the right number of ships, but having the warfare capability. 
this is a demand for leadership right now in an area that so few people know about, but time's a wasting. So I, I would note, uh, and, and I, I agree with Joe's main points here, the challenge is that we, we are trying to do a lot of different things. Uh, when you look at uh, the defense budget, when you look at all the areas of focus, when you look at the, the balancing act between how do we resource our uh, steady state operational profile in terms of deployed assets around the world versus how do we look at uh, what we call the theory of victory associated with our adversaries, the different combat and commands, and the different scenarios that we have war, range of war planning activities for in terms of being prepared for any eventuality. So how do we look at the theory of victory of our adversaries? How do we look at uh, their focus on asymmetrically attriting us prior to the advent of warfare? And, and, if, and if warfare is unavoidable from their perspective and they would like to win without a war, they want to put themselves in a position of advantage to win if it does if it does cross over into conflict. So we need to be thinking very hard about the trade-offs associated with trying to have everything. And and I think that that requires hard decisions and hard decisions are obviously hard to make, but that's that's what if you look at the these commissions, the graybeard groups that get together at the end of the day, sometimes the hardest decisions they recommend, uh, you know, there, there just isn't the intestinal fortitude to, to go through with some of them. Could I add on to what he said, John, if you don't mind? Sure, go ahead. Um, you know, this is his point about preparing in peacetime they are, is well taken. It's why the previous administration, with you in it, Ken, rightly, in my opinion, said, don't go by in that 5G network. Because the important part about this battle is, if we don't have our allies and friends with us, this is not one that we can protect democratic values, never mind a war. That network, that AI is affects one over there, it affects us here. That 5G network will be connected to ours. And if they have the information, with a piece of gear collecting everything over there, it's going to be going through there. I understand the great debate about two separate systems in this world. But we have a choice to make here. And one is to understand that America's exceptionalism is truly its power to convene, to bring nations together for a common cause that serves us all. That's our greatest power. And we can't do this without allies and friends, which is why people like Ken were reaching over to them to say, Look, understand, this is the new game, the new warfare of the future. So it's not just our Congress. It's just not, you know, our industry. It, everyone makes this. And that after we sold Lucent, our ability to do this 5G went over to France, which migrated up to the Scandinavian countries, and only two of them make it. This is an immense opportunity for us to bring back together the rules-based world order in a way that says, if you want our values to continue, we've got to do this together. So that's the other challenge we have. Yeah, it's really hard to exaggerate the impacts and implications of 5G. And, and that was a primary emphasis of the Trump administration. Uh, I think some headway was made. Uh, I think some opportunities um, uh, uh, you know, were not fully taken advantage of in other circumstances. But that is a priority, and uh, I think it needs to remain a priority because the trade-off for a number of these countries, particularly those countries uh, that that China is really looking to be put in a position where they can be manipulated, is the advantage of the free lunch today or the lower cost capability today vis-a-vis -vis the implications, the risk, and vulnerabilities in the future. And the Chinese uh, played this very well. Uh, but you can see in some areas, the Brits uh, have, have come back a little bit from uh, being a little bit more forward leaning with Huawei. The Australians are, are hanging tough and you're seeing other countries that were a little bit more wobbly who are now more fully considering where the, what the path line is for China right now and the implications of, of uh, Huawei in the 5G system. So 
that's another one of those really tough trade-offs though, because it's not as if there's a lot of capability out there. There are some nodes of capability in Europe and some capabilities in the United States, but it's more expensive than uh, what the Chinese are offering. So how do we look to best facilitate the trade-offs in a manner that is going to get the right answers made, the, the right decisions made with regard to paying more now because it is worth it for the resilience and security that the system developed will have. Well, if you guys were to be sitting across the uh, desk from President Biden in the Oval Office right now, what would you uh, advise him to do in terms of uh, you know, technological policy and uh, moving our industry to uh, come back into the United States and to uh, focus on what's best for the country instead of the bottom line? Well, I think his most important gambit should be to point as heads of not each of his services, because if one service is not doing this cybersecurity or, cyber, uh, or AI, then the other one will suffer because we're connected in joint warfare. But also to make sure that at that table, day in and day out, is the head of the homeland. This is an interagency issue. But you need the heads of the people, of the departments that are got to affect that, to be ones that are imbued with the acknowledgement that this is the new domain of warfare. And, and, and then the resources have to be controlled by them. I mean, it's why we continue to build another ship rather than worrying about having the best connection to the army. I mean, given the margin of money you have, you're gonna build that ship. And if you really believe this is the domain, then the resources need to be moved into the person or the entity that is going to apply them. And that's the tough decision, one of the tough decisions that Ken brought up. Because if whoever controls the money controls what comes out the pipe at the other end. And you can see this today in the Navy, where for the fifth year in a row, its readiness has decreased. And so as we try to hold on to force structure and try to keep it ready, rather than saying, what is it that we really are going to have to spend our resources for and then put that into the pot when those people who really believe in this, I don't see any other way that you're going to make it. Another commission isn't going to do it. A czar way up here would be nice, but you know, you have to have those people that are just above the services and the other places that truly are going to make them transform. But it isn't gonna happen, I think. But Ken, you're more close to this than I am. So uh, I, I think the biggest problem that I see is how difficult it is to prioritize. We have uh, such a range of very important objectives when it comes to economic and national security that, uh, you know, I, and they're not, they're all important, but the bottom line is they're not all equal. And, uh, you know, something Secretary Mattis used to say is we have three priorities in DOD, China, China, and China. So, that that china really is the extant threat in terms of its potential when you look at its behavior when you look at its capabilities when you look at the supply chain issues noted we have got to focus on what is the most existential threat to the united states china importantly is a competitor we want to keep china a competitor but we also want to we want to create a lot of good reasons for China not to continue down the path that it is going in a variety of different areas. And it's, it's impossible to do that while servicing a lot of other granted important priorities, but to the disadvantage of the single most critical priority. Well said. Uh, I'm sorry to interrupt, but uh, we have a lot of good questions. So let's go ahead and move to those uh, audience questions. All right. Um, go ahead. 
Given leftist bias in universities and current resistance expressed by American tech companies, how do we incentivize US students to pursue degrees in science, technology, engineering, and mathematics, and more importantly, apply those skills in support of military research efforts in critical areas like AI? Well, you know, we give incentives for at, at times, uh, and I have, I voted for them. Uh, where if a teacher would go into STEM, uh, you know, a student would go into STEM and then commit to teach for a certain period of time, there would be some forgiveness of loans. You know, we do that in the military. If you will go nuclear power, we'll pay you more. <laughs> and so I hate to say it, but that's the way that we have to do it. You want to try to attract cyber talent in the military when you can go out to the Silicon Valley and become a consultant and try to make it happen, it's gonna be pretty tough unless you recognize, as we do throughout the military, that there are certain uh, specific uh, entities that you have to attract in certain ways. And I don't see any other way. There's a lot of good men and women who join up and are gonna be wonderful warriors, but to get all the raw talent you need and to make it that priority, I think we need to do what we did for nuclear power. In, in, in that way. And I also think that you're already addressing a larger issue to this. And, and whether it's rightist or leftist, I, I don't care. That stuff doesn't bother. What that matters to me is that we have to get back to, to having the youth of America understand who the military is. And I say that because when you look at where the breadth of Americans go into the military, it isn't equally across all the United States. And we have to be able to have people understand that we need money from every type of university and everything and, and every area of this world, because I think that's what gives us our greatest heft. So you don't get viewpoints that are biased about, about it. I mean, I can remember when I was running once, the first time, I was an independent military, became a Democrat, went to nearly two to one Republican district, which you know, John, you were there. And I said, mm -hmm. hey, and, I, and I won. But I remember I didn't get an environmental group's endorsement the first time. And a board member told me why afterwards. And she said, well, he, board member said, you're military, can I trust him? That type of bias does exist at times. But on the other hand, you know, I was a gentleman that despite, you know, the, the other things was, was 100% voting records on the environment. So my point is that I think we need a better understanding of who these wonderful men and women and warriors are throughout this nation. And we have to keep that in mind, particularly that uh, today where I think to uh, Ken's point, China is emerging and it's not doing it in a way that is conducive to democratic values. Um, yeah. I, I think that's I think that's important. I, I, I think that again, same point with regard to the government needs to incentivize it, and the government also needs to ensure that we are more optimally organized and equipped as a federal government in terms of how we're handling these different areas. So, for example, in cyber, you see a number of recommendations with regard to the the uh, the Cyber Solarium project. Uh, you see the AI report that just came out from the National Commission talking about establishing specific areas of focus and education within the government for AI. I mean, AI, again, it's important to remember, it's, it's not a mission, it's, it's, not, it's an enabler to virtually or literally anything that you can improve by virtue of having this um, extremely capable uh, ability to generate insights and context and expertise. So that's 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 happening in many respects, but it's really then focusing what are the most critical outcomes that we believe AI should be focused from the federal government's perspective at least, that we need to be sure that we are applying appropriate resources, energy and and talent. Unfortunately, folks, uh, that'll, that'll be the only question. <laughs> but uh, there was a lot of rich information there, but we, uh, we ran a little over. So, John, um, if you'd like to just close up uh, for a minute, and I'll do some announcements.
Well, I'd like to thank uh, Joe and Ken for uh, coming on this uh, webinar and uh, giving us an hour to uh, pick their brains about uh, what's probably one of the most uh, important issues facing our uh, country and our military today. It's been very enlightening, and uh, you know, I thank both of you, uh, and uh, I look forward to uh, continuing working with you in the future. Thanks, John. Thanks, Ken. Yeah, thank you. Appreciate it, John. Joe. Oh, uh, upcoming, we have two special programs. Uh, usual time next week at 1 p.m. Uh, we'll be uh, featuring Ambassador Pete Hoekstra, who's the new chairman of the Center's Advisory Board. Uh, so this event will be unveiling the board. We'll have a panel with several members on Biden's national security strategy at 100 days. Uh, the advisory board will include Congressman uh, Peter King and Michelle Bachman, as well as former CIA Director Jim Woolsey. And we'll confer, uh, confirm the details on that uh, soon. Uh, also on May 12th at 1 p.m., the Center President Fred Flights and Center Senior Analyst David Wormser will co-host a special webinar with former Secretary of State Mike Pompeo. They plan to discuss a wide range of issues with Secretary Pompeo, which will concentrate on China and Iran. Well, uh, if you uh, enjoy these sessions as much as I do, uh, make sure that uh, you keep them going by giving your generous support. Um, you can visit our website at securefreedom.org and click on the big red donate button in the upper right corner, where you can make an instant contribution by credit card and get information on other methods of giving. Thanks again to our guests. We'll see you next Wednesday at 1 p.m. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you.